consciousness and you have this creative principle at work, which is not the same, by the way, as a supernatural creative uh, thing about God outside the universe creating it, as the Judeo-Christian understanding, but it's contained within. It expands and primeval matter and life comes from that. They have a concept that it doesn't just start as a, an atomic particle and expands uh, and blows apart, but you also get this thing. It says here, these, that is the creative processes that the universe goes through, in succession acquire the attributes of the immediately preceding ones from which they have originated. Each has not only its own special attribute, but each succeeding one has the attributes of all the previous ones, and that's from the Mahabharata. So that principle is contained right from the beginning at the start of our particular present universe and is contained within the whole process, including life. That what was before uh, is built on. So in other words, there were more simple forms and more complex forms were built up out of it through a process. So what do we say about the Hindu cosmic evolution in a very simple understanding, not like our complex ideas today? The universe is cyclical. Motion involving consciousness causes an atomic particle to appear. The particle or the egg as it expands and explodes, forming the universe. Out of this, there is an evolutionary progress, progression from particles to philosophers. This process takes billions of years. So I'm quite familiar, even though this is such ancient uh, philosophical understanding. Let's move on now to Hindu biological evolution and reincarnation. Now, if you look on the right-hand picture, there's a picture of um, reincarnation. In one sense, reincarnation's got nothing whatsoever to do with evolution. Because what you have is a person dies and a soul leaves the person and ends up in another life form. It could go up and become a, uh, another lighter-skinned human being, or it could go down in animal form, depending on karma, whether the person's done good deeds or bad deeds, and so on. That's very much written into Hindu religious understanding. But before you just cast aside reincarnation, there's another point which also is grafted in with reincarnational understanding, is as, as an upward tree. It's often referred to as a tree of life. You find this often in ancient cultures, uh, what's called the tree of life. And you have simpler forms developing up a tree until they become more and more complex. And um, that thinking is what we'll trace through um, tonight. Let me just give you... Um, so I'll put that one back. Yeah. We'll follow that through as we go through tonight. And I'm going to now look at some of the other things in understanding of, of Hindu thinking. One of the things they believed in was the concept of life from non-life, what we call spontaneous generation, which was accepted for thousands of years, right up till 1869, I think, by Louis Pasteur. It was regarded as being one of the best proofs of evolution. Um, and many of those who, at the time of Charles uh, Darwin, accepted it. Now, they had a more sophisticated understanding of it concerning bacteria. But the more primitive understanding of it was this, that things like mosquitoes, gnats, lice, flies and maggots, other species of this sort, originate from heat, are born of sweat or moisture. This was known in the Egyptian understanding. Aristotle later also took it through into the Western understanding. In other words, that life can come by itself um, from non-animate to animate. And that is a very important link as we look through. Now, here's some quotations from some of the uh, under Hindu writings. This one. They, the plants, have an eternal consciousness. In this terrible cycle of transmigration, that's another word for reincarnation, which moves relentlessly on and on, the levels of existence are said to begin with Brahma, that's the creative principle, remember, and to end with them. Laws of Manu. Another one. Whatever creation is born is resolved once more and is moved again by the merits and demerits acquired in that life and enters into another body resulting from its deeds. His habitation always resulting from nascence, desire and acts. He migrates from one body to body, leaving off one another repeatedly urged on by time, like a person leaving house 
one after another in succession. So you have that reincarnation thing, but you also have an upward push that's going on, driven on by, by desire. And we'll find uh, this also mentioned in, a, in, in what's called the Padma Purana. It says that there are 20,000 species of non-mobile plants, Svara, 900,000 species of aquatic creatures, 900,000 species of amphibians and reptiles, a million species of birds, 3 million species of other creatures such as animals, 400 species of anthropoids, that's called Venaras, after which the human species, Manchusha, of 200,000 varieties comes into being, and man then engages in purposeful activity to attain perfection. Now what they're saying through that is this, this tree of life coming from a simple form of plants through aquatic creatures, through amphibians and reptiles, uh, through various animals, through to anthropoids, monkeys, uh, through to apes and so forth, through into the human, uh, 200,000 varieties, which is rather a lot, and man engaging in purpose, purposeful activity to attain perfection, which is all about the yoga system, uh, which I mentioned just briefly at the end. But also in the Rig Vedas, going back a long time, um, they also had an understanding. The evolution, when it came to man, you then had the caste system. You had the Sudra, which were the dark-skinned African or Aboriginal human beings. And then there was, uh, this evolution took place through into then the Vaisya, which is a lighter skin, through to the uh, Kasatriya, which is more the warrior caste, lighter skinned again. And finally, the Aryans, the white-skinned Brahmin, who were the philosopher kings and the priests, as it were, of Hinduism. Now, interesting enough, um, when you look, and I'll be dealing with this in a second talk I'll be doing in November, you will see something of that uh, after Charles Darwin uh, was accepted and uh, through into the 20th century, culminating sadly uh, with the final solution and Hitler, Hitler's kind of ideas. But you see this whole drive with a supreme area in the top of the evolutionary understanding. And those, in those days, time of Darwin and through to the 20th century, it was so, told by some people that you would never have, you could never possibly have, say, an African being a professor of science or something or government or anything like that because they were not highly evolved enough. As I said, that's quite a touchy subject, but we're going to look at that, fruits of evolution, um, later on in the series. But just to show you the uh, the roots of some of these things. Swami Vivekananda was a famous um, Hindu uh, expert and scholar who came over and wowed Britain in his tours and also in America in Chicago. Um, a, a quite extraordinary man, incredible memory he had. Uh, and uh, he seemed to be one of these people that could dip into all sorts of things and memorize things so quickly. I wish I could do that. But this is something he said as a leading scholar representing Hinduism and speaking to the West. What is the cause of evolution? Desire. The animal wants to do something, but it does not find the environments favorable and therefore develops a new body. Who develops it? The animal itself, its will. You have developed from the lowest amoeba. Continue to exercise your will and it will take you higher still. The will is almighty. If it is almighty, you may say, why cannot I do everything? But you are only thinking only of your little self. Look back on yourself, selves from the state of the amoeba to the human being. Who made all that? Your own will. Can you deny then that it is almighty? That which has made you come up so high can make you go higher still. And that was a speech in London, 1895. And of course, the end product with evolution, once you go through all this spiritual, this evolution right through the whole lot, you end up with the spiritual evolution of yoga. And they have so-called seven energy centers in the body beginning at the base of the spine right through to, you've probably seen Hindus with a, a red dot on, on, on their heads, the third eye. And enlightenment where you become as God. You merge with Godhood. And uh, that is the ultimate um, in Hinduism. And that's the spiritual evolution part of it. Well, now let's look at uh, going west. And Pythagoras, um, now he's probably known most of you probably because of uh, theorems to do with math math mathematics or in some cases some of you may have heard of his understanding of music or uh, sound and that type of thing. All quite fascinating. 
Not much is actually particularly known about him because he didn't actually leave any writings. But his disciples wrote about the things that he taught and his philosophies and his ideas. Um, he spent 22 years in the Egyptian pyramids, well, with Egyptian priests, studying under their philosophy and religious ideas. Then he went to Babylon, and for 12 years he studied under the Chaldean priests and the Persian Magi um, and others. But what's particularly interesting, as I dug around, I found that he also studied with the Brahmins, the, the Hindus. And here's a reference from Clement of Alexandria, who studied, um, he was a Christian, but he studied at the famous school of Alexandria, which was a Neoplatonic school um, in Egypt in the 3rd century AD. And he said, Pythagoras was a hero of the Galatai and the Brahmins. And Iamblichus was Pythagoras' biographer of some centuries um, after. Pythagoras travelled widely, studying the esoteric teachings of the Egyptians, the Assyrians, and even the Brahmins. And there are two of them, there are other references too in the ancient sources to Pythagoras being influenced by the Brahmin Hindus. <coughs> we can see some of the influences in Py Pythagoras' uh, practice. He believed in reincarnation, which is very clearly a Hindu uh, uh, root. Asceticism, very much like the Hindu gurus practice today. Vegetarianism. It was a taboo to eat certain kinds of beans. You might think it's a bit odd, but anyway, they did that. And you would find in also some Hindu understanding some of the gurus the same thing. They weren't allowed to, eat, to cut their nails or their beards or their hair. And again, if you look at some of the gurus, they have the same understanding. Mathemath mathematical theorems were discussed and worked through. The same with Vedantic philosophy uh, in ancient India. And the music and study of sound also, likewise, with the Hindu Brahmins. Just in case you just think I'm getting too carried away, here's some of the leading scholars who did some in investigation concerning this. And the first quotation is from Sir William Jones, who was a pioneer of Western study of Sanskrit. Um, and he, was, um, uh, he kept in touch with a chap called Lord Monboddo, actually, from the Enlightenment period here in Scotland. We'll hear more about him later. He's a key figure. Back and forth, they wrote letters. And he said uh, to Lord Monboddo, the analogies between the Greek Pythagorean philosophy and the Sankhya school are very obvious. Sankhya was basically, there were two main schools of philosophy in ancient Hindu, India. One was, was Vedantic, the other was, was Sankhya. Um, so that's his understanding. Professor Rawlinson was an archaeologist Victorian period, and uh, he said, it's more likely that Pythagoras was influenced by India than by Egypt. Almost all the theories, religious, philosophical, and mathematical, taught by the Pythagoreans were known in India in the 6th century BC. In fact, centuries before Pythagoras was even born, those things were being discussed in India, and the Brahmins travelled and discussed them with other people and loved to debate with people in the marketplace. Let's move on to another figure. Um, Pythagoras and Plato, and later we'll look at Aristotle, are key people in founding a lot of the Western understanding and philosophy. Now, Plato was a disciple of Socrates. Um, and uh, Socrates, we read in some of the ancient writings, debated with some Brahmin priests, uh, Brahmin philosophers in the marketplace in Athens. Socrates himself believed in reincarnation. And some of the ideas you follow through, through Plato's writings, when he's speaking as a mouthpiece for Socrates are very similar to the Hindu understanding. Plato was, of course, influenced by others. Uh, he, he went through studying different philosophers. Heraclitus, who said that everything came through fire, um, and various other ones. But he spent a lot of money buying some very ancient books on, in his collection on some leading Pythagoreans, all about uh, physics and science and metaphysics, a philosophy. And he had a great influence from Pythagoras as well as Socrates. Now he said in Timaeus, in his own writing, these are the principles on which living creatures change and have changed into one another. The transformation depending on the loss or gain of understanding or folly. Now he understood, just as the Hindu Brahmins had, 
that living things can change. They are not fixed, but they change. They go through a process of fluidity, they change. And he understood that.